Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Pastor Small. We are reaching out to you again, sharing in our Summer Madness series as we are bringing the best and brightest preachers of our Summer Madness series. This time around, we're gonna hear from my good friend and brother who has a word even now in the season of this pandemic, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, pastor of the Alpha Street Baptist Church. He's gonna share with us and ask the question, what is the source of your strength? We're gonna to get to the root of the matter today and hope indeed that you are blessed by this word. We know it's going to bless you again, so we want you to tune in and stay there. Be good. We'll see you the next time. Peace. Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and Jesus, who is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and returning Redeemer. We thank the Lord our God for this another day that the Lord has made. And the opportunity we have to have enough good sense to be on the Lord's house on this the day the Lord has made to worship our true and our living God. The fact that you are here on a Wednesday night is a sign that you've come a mighty long way with the Lord. But there used to be a time when Wednesday night meant some of anything other than being in the house of God. If you're grateful for this day that the Lord has made, would you help me bless God with just an offering of praise in whatever way? You praise the Lord our God. God is good and greatly to be praised. I am grateful, humble, and excited for the opportunity to stand once again in this place and share with you my conviction of God's grace and his saving love in Jesus Christ. And I don't take it for granted, the invitation extended to me by a brother who's been in my life for more than two decades now. And to some people, you know, when you see him coming, you just want to walk in another direction. You know somebody that fits that bill. And then there's some people, even if you haven't seen them for a year, when you see them next, you just want to run up to them and it seems like time has stood still. The Reverend Dr. William Marcus Small is just that kind of friend to me. Whenever I see him, I'm grateful to be in his presence, to catch up, to hear of the amazing things God is doing in him and through him here at New Calvary. If you love him more than anybody else does, would you just help your pastor know that he's appreciated in this house for who and what he is. Amen. Bless you, brother. I tell people, pastoring is not for the faint of heart. And you ought to praise the Lord your God when you've got it. You know what? You don't appreciate a good pastor till you've had a bad one. And my prayer is that you never have to have a bad one to appreciate the gift that God has given to you. I honor him tonight and to his partner in life and love and marriage and in ministry for all the joy that she adds to his life and the life of this church family. <laughs> no story of a man, a people, a church can be told without listing the names of the women who've made it possible. And how grateful to God we are that God has seen fit to partner him in a way that gives him the strength to do what God has called him to do. In a real sense, he can't stand here if she don't stand next to him. And so we bless God and pray over their marriage, pray that God will keep them and their hearts knit together as they continue to parent and raise their children and to be good stewards of this assignment God has given them here at New Calvary. To all those in this place who share the burden and the blessing of preaching God's holy word, especially my classmate and cohort, the Reverend Dr. Nicole McDonald, we'll be back in class together in about a month, and we got a whole lot of reading to do between now and then. As old saints would say, pray our strength in the Lord, amen. We've got a long journey together, and I'm glad to be in her presence. To those who have rendered their voices in song tonight, I see you scattered out. Thank you so much. It, I don't know if that's what you, what you call that choir. The pastor called them the Summer Madness Chorale. I, I just called them good. Amen. That's all. And I want to thank you all for blessing us in song on tonight. So when I walked in and realized all the preachers that had preceded me, and knowing the caliber and character of those who have stood in this season, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Blunt, Otis Moss III, the Reverend Dr. Gina Marie Stewart, I asked myself, what is there left to say? Um, and I was really upset with trying to figure out why your pastor would invite me after so much great preaching has already occurred in this place. And Nicole, I finally figured it out. I need to let you know, I, the former basketball player, I made varsity squad as a freshman. I was the first freshman to make varsity in my high school, but when I made the team, 
I really didn't get to play a lot. As a freshman, I sat the bench. And my job was to slide up and down as players got in the game. The only time the coach let me play was in the fourth quarter if we were winning by like 45, 50 points. When he was certain victory had been ascertained, I was allowed to get on the court. So if you get up in the fourth quarter and I'm up, it must mean that victory has already been achieved and accomplished. You're already saved. You're already redeemed. And coach is just giving me some playing time in the fourth quarter. So coach, I thank you for letting me get on the court, knowing that the victory is already secured. Listen, I ask that you pray with me. I've reached a kind of strange season in my walk with the Lord. I don't seek to impress people when I preach anymore. Um, in a real sense, I'm not concerned with whether you shout or not. Uh, my desire is to be faithful to what I believe God has pressed on my heart. And I'm simply going to ask that if, if this message is relevant and real for you, if it pulls up in your driveway, if it sits on your couch, after the service is over, just tap me on the shoulder and say, that was for me. And I know that I've been faithful to the assignment of God. If you were turning your Bibles with me or on your devices and journey with me into the Old Testament, the first covenant, if you would able to navigate yourself to the book of Judges, the book of Judges, that seventh book of the Bible, and find with me, if you will, the 16th chapter as you listen for the word of God as I read out of the New King James Version of God's Holy Word, beginning in verse number 15. Once again, that's Judges chapter 16, beginning in verse number 15, as we seek to hear a word from the Lord. In the New King James Version, the Holy Word of God reads as follows. Then she, meaning Delilah, said to him, meaning Samson, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. And he said to her, Delilah, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the Lord to the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the Lord to the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. As we review this familiar Sunday school passage, I just came by New Calvary to ask you a simple question. What is the source of your strength? What is the source of your strength? About two years ago, while playing basketball with my 14-year-old son, and trying to remind him that I'm still better than him, a small, I made a move to the basket attempting to dunk on him. I took off, only to be reminded that I'm over 40 years old now. I jumped with my right leg, but my left leg decided to stay put. I tore my patellar tendon, was rushed to the emergency room, endured four hours of surgery, eight weeks of immobility and no walking. After four hours of surgery and eight weeks of laying still on the bed, I then began my journey into physical therapy. In my first session with my physical therapist, she shared with me that the journey to recovery and ever having a chance of playing basketball again would take about nine 
months. Four hours of surgery, eight weeks of no walking, only to be followed up with nine months of physical therapy. I said, the devil is a liar. I'm an athlete. It is not going to take me nine months to get back on the basketball court. Sure enough, you all, after three months, I was able to bend my knee with full flexion. I was able to walk. I could do what I thought I needed to do. And I told my therapist, listen, we don't have to go for six more months. Now that I can walk, now that I can bend my knee, I'm going to get back on the court. And she said, that would be the biggest mistake you have ever made. She said, because now that you can bend your knee, we've got to work on re-strengthening the quadricep in your left leg because it is atrophied after eight weeks of no walking. In a real sense, your right leg is stronger than your left leg. And I said to her, I'll take care of it myself. She said, Reverend, you will never walk right until you deal with what's weak in your left leg. She said, understand this, your ability to live and walk right is not determined by how strong your right leg is, but rather how weak your left leg is. And until you deal with your weakness, you will never rise to the level of your strength. Somebody, you're a little slow. You think I'm talking about legs. I'm talking about life. For the reality is it doesn't matter how strong you are in one area of your life. It is not your strength that determines how high you rise, but rather your weakness that keeps you bound from being what God has called you to be. And until you deal with your weakness, your strength will never take you where it can go. Beloved, I came by to tell you on a Wednesday night, God can give you great strength. God can give you favor. God can give you unprecedented opportunities. God can give you skill and talent. But until you deal with the weaknesses in your life, that favor, that opportunity, that skill, that talent will never allow you to be what God has called you to be because you've got to learn how to deal with weakness. And everybody in here knows somebody who was strong in one area, but never amounted to what they could be because they had a weakness that they could not deal with. If nobody jumped to your mind, allow me to reintroduce you to one. You know him well. His name is Samson. You met Samson in second grade Sunday school. In case you don't remember, Samson is the son of a man from the tribe of Dan named Manoah. And Manoah's nameless wife wrestles with infertility. Manoah and his wife are barren. Till one day an angel of the Lord comes and tells her, God has heard your prayers. And God is going to give you a son, but there's a restriction. Because the boy is going to be a Nazarite which means that God has an assignment on his life, and because of that assignment, there are certain things you cannot do, and there are certain things he cannot do, because he is a Nazarite. Let the church say Nazarite. If you go back to your Bible and you read Numbers chapter 6, you'll find the restrictions of being a Nazarite. Let me give them to you. There are three restrictions to being a Nazarite. Take notes because there will be a pop quiz at the end of the sermon. Three restrictions. Number one, no alcoholic drink. This boy can never drink alcohol. Number two, no dead corpse. He can never touch a dead corpse. Number three, no haircut. His hair can never be cut. Let me run them by you again to make certain you don't fail the quiz later. Number one, he can drink no, no alcohol, no, no, no Ciroc, no Goose, no Hen, no, no Chardonnay, no Merlot, no Moscato. Have I called George yet? Uh, would you know somebody tell them that's why you ain't a Nazarite? That's, that, 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 no alcohol can ever cross his lips. Number two, he can touch no dead corpse. And number three, he can never have his hair shaven. And with those restrictions, God has an assignment on Samson. And Samson's assignment is to lead the children of Israel and their armies in battle and victory against the Philistines. 
Samson is to be a military commander. And in order to fulfill that assignment, God gives Samson unprecedented human physical strength. When you met Samson in second grade, they taught you he's the strongest man in the Bible. Samson's so strong, he can defeat the armies of Ashkelon all by himself. Samson is such a bad mamma jamma that, that he's able to kill a lion with his bare hands. And armed with only the jawbone of a donkey, he kills a thousand Philistines without breaking a sweat. Nobody is as strong as Samson. But for all of his strength, Samson never became what God ordained him to be. He never won a battle. He never commanded the armies of Israel. As a matter of fact, Samson's life is so pathetic that when he dies, nobody even shows up to the funeral. Samson never rises to the level of his strength. Why? Because Samson has some weaknesses that he's never dealt with. And those weaknesses are exposed through the presence of a bad sister named Delilah. Delilah, 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 Delilah and Jezebel, those are just two names you don't give your daughter. <laughs> if you ever meet someone named Delilah, their mama failed Sunday school. <laughs> Delilah is synonymous with seduction. Delilah is synonymous with taking a brother out. Here's the way the story unplays. The Philistines are sick of Samson. They're tired of playing around with him. They're tired of him coming in and out of their territory, doing whatever he wants, having fun with them, killing their people. But they know that one man can't defeat Samson. As a matter of fact, a thousand men can't defeat Samson. They have found out what a thousand men can't do. One sister is able to handle. There ought to be a feminine amen right there. That, that makes some sense to some sister here tonight that what a man can't do, Delilah can get done. So they come to Delilah and they say, listen, we'll each give you 1,100 pieces of silver if you'll just find out what is the source of Samson's strength. She goes to Samson and three times he gives her a wrong answer. She says, Samson, what's the source of your strength? He said, baby, if, if you tie me up with seven bowstrings, if, if you bind me with new rope, if you braid my hair, and then finally he tells her, all right, D, here's the truth. If you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man. He goes to sleep, wakes up, his hair is cut, goes out to battle, and the Bible says, that he did not know that the Lord had left him. Beloved, I hope you hear the damnable situation. It's one thing for God to leave you. It's another thing for you to not know it. He has no clue that God ain't with him anymore. He goes out to battle, and you know the rest of the story. He loses, he's captured, and eventually he's killed. And what I have to ask is how could the strongest man in the Bible, with all that God had given them the ability to do, how could he be taken down by one sister? There are some weaknesses Samson deals with, some weaknesses that will affect you and I if we don't learn to get a control of them right here and right now. Can I give you three of them and then I'll get out your way? Three weaknesses that hurt Samson, that will hurt you, and they will hurt me. Number one, Samson is fixated on his feelings and not focused on the facts. Let me go and say that again that you may understand what will weaken you when you are fixated on your feelings and not focused on fact. Here's what took Samson down. He 
allowed what his heart felt to ignore what his mind knew. Can I preach right here? Can I teach Sunday school? Watch the relationship of Samson and Delilah. Three times she comes to him and asks him the source of his strength, and three times he knows he has to lie to her. Watch what happens. Uh, uh, Bay, what's the source of your strength? Samson says, if you tie me up with seven new ropes, he goes to sleep. When he wakes up, he's tied with seven new ropes, and the Philistines are outside. The next day, baby, what's the source of your strength? If you tie me up with new bowstrings, he goes to sleep. He wakes up, he's tied with bowstrings, and the Philistines are outside. Next day, baby, what's the source of your strength? If you braid my hair, he goes to sleep, he wakes up, his hair is braided, and the Philistines are outside. Now the one thing you got to know by now, <laughs> that is clear as day, you can't trust Delilah. She is up to something. She's trying to take you out. Every time you tell her she does what you say, you know good and daggone well, that woman ain't no good. Now, if he knows she ain't no good, why tell her about his hair? If you know every time you tell her she sets you up, why would you tell her the truth? Because she put him in touch with his feelings. That's what she says. If you love me. Sisters, close your ears. Brothers, um, if your woman ever starts a sentence with, if you love me, it's going to cost you something. She says, Samson, don't you love me? And she makes him tap into his heart and shut off what he knows to be true in his head. Listen, beloved, having feelings doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. Feelings are real. Feelings are powerful. Feelings are passionate. But feelings are not always true. Feelings are not always based on fact. Feelings can mislead you. Feelings can deceive you. Feelings can tell you something that you know in your mind cannot be the reality of what you're dealing with. But because your feelings are so deep, if you don't listen to what is going on in your head and only follow what is going on in your heart, you will wind up making some bad decisions because you will drown in a sea of feeling if you ain't got no fact to hold on to. Beloved, feelings are so deceptive. God never reveals his will through your emotions. God speaks through his word. God speaks through the Holy Spirit. God can speak through a bad solo. God can speak through a bad sermon. God speaks through wise counsel. God speaks through revelation. God speaks through signs and wonders. But nowhere in the Bible does God speak through what you feel. As a matter of fact, this is what the Bible says. Come on, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do what? Lean not. Go and help me preach right there. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust everything you feel. Don't trust every emotion that runs through you because sometimes your emotions will lead you outside of truth. And the most deceptive feeling in the world is love. This ain't for the children, but the grown folk in here know that everybody in here has done something stupid because you thought you were in love. Go and wink amen at me right there. Uh, uh, being in love will have you sitting outside of somebody's house at 3 in the morning trying to figure out who's coming in and who's going out. Love will mislead you. The main ingredient had it right. I know you don't want to hear it, but I got to tell it to you. Everybody plays the fool sometime. Maybe factual, 
may be cruel, but everybody plays the fool sometime. And when you are in love, you will do some of the stupidest, dumbest things that you have ever done in your life because you listen to your heart and shut up what you know to be in your head. Every now and then, I wish you would do what I would tell Samson you need to do. Every now and then, you need to tell God, God, open my eyes. Let me see it for what it is. Give me the truth of what I'm dealing with. Tell me the fact, God, let me see it and not be misled by my emotions. And whatever God shows you, baby, it is what it is. If it ain't no good, it ain't no good. If he's a liar, he's just a daggone liar. If she's low down, she's just low down. If it's trifling, it's just trifling. You got to accept that it is what it is. As long as you are guided by feeling with no fact, you will be weakened in life. Don't trust your emotions without some intellect in it. Samson is fixated on his feelings and not focused on the facts. Can I give you a second reason why Samson's weak? Uh, Samson is weak not only because he's fixated on his feelings and not focused on the facts, uh, but Samson is weak because he's seduced by his success into a space of self-sufficiency. Stay with me. He's seduced by success to a space of self-sufficiency. Can I teach Bible tonight? Is that, it's Wednesday. By the time we meet Samson in Judges 16, most scholars argue that Samson is at least 20 years old. 20 years old with no haircut. Now, you don't have to have a PhD in theology to know that's a lot of hair. 20 years no haircut, that's a lot of hair. Lila asked him what the source of your strength is. He says, if you cut my hair. Samson has so much hair that when she braids it, it goes into seven dreadlocks that go all the way down his back. Somebody say, that's a lot of hair. He lays down on her lap. And we've always been taught she cut his hair off, and that is not what the Bible says. She lays, he lays down on her lap. She hires a man to come into the bedroom and shave his head while he sleep on her lap. He don't even wake up. Another man comes in the bedroom, <laughs> shaves his head, and he don't even wake up. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a meddler. I, I like to meddle with stuff. Um, what did she put on him? <laughs> that let him sleep through another man shaving his head. This isn't no cut with scissors. This is razor shave while he sleep on her lap. He wakes up, and I'll suggest to you that with 20 years of hair shaved off, Marcus, there's no way he doesn't know his hair is gone. You cannot have 20 years of hair shaved off and not know it. You cannot go from dreadlocks to a fade and not know it. As a matter of fact, every sister in here knows when your beautician has cut too much and you ain't even got to look in the mirror, you can sit in the chair and know she cut too much. You know when your hair's been cut. If he knows that his hair's been cut and if he knows his strength is in his hair, why does he go fight knowing he bald-headed? He knows his strength is not on his head anymore. Why does he go fight if he knows he's got a haircut? 
Listen to what he says. I will go out and shake myself free as I have done before. Even though his hair has been cut, he looks behind at his past success and believes that if I could do it then, then I can do it even right now. Even though his hair has been cut, he's so seduced by what he's been able to do in the past that he has no realization that he can't do it anymore. Can I push this real quick? And what's even more disturbing, he doesn't even pray to God before he goes out. He just gets up and runs into battle thinking that if I did it then, I can do it now, and I don't even need God's help. I came all the way from Alexandria to meddle with you tonight and ask you a question. What are you so good at you don't have to pray about anymore? What are you so proficient at that you don't even bow before God and ask God to put his hand on it before you put your hand on it? What do you do so well in life that you don't even ask God to give you strength and to walk with you and to help you do it again? Beloved, I am scared of saints who think they can do it all by themselves. Uh, I want to worship with some folk that know I need God like right now. I need God today as much as I needed God yesterday. Is there anybody here who knows the words of that old hymn, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, God. I need God. Don't you ever think that you're so good that you don't need God? I want to wonder how could Samson think he didn't need God? It's right there in what he says. I will go out and I will shake myself free as I have done so many times before. You missed that. That's a whole lot of first person. I will go out and I will shake myself free as I have done so many times before. Here is the problem Samson made. He looked back at his previous victories and came to the conclusion that he did them all by himself. He thought he killed the lion by himself. He thought he defeated the armies by himself. He thought he killed the Philistines by himself. And now here he stands believing he's a self-made man. And beloved, one of the things that will weaken you most in this life is believing you got where you are by yourself. And not recognizing that it's not a cliche, it's truth. If it had not been... Go and help me preach. For the Lord on our side, if God hadn't showed up, if the Lord hadn't been in it, if God hadn't opened the door, if God hadn't made the way, if God didn't answer the prayer, if God didn't wake me up, if God didn't give me favor, if God didn't stand in my mind, if God didn't strengthen my heart, if the Lord didn't walk with me, baby girl, brother man, I would be dead right now, but I'm standing only because God gave me the strength And you will be weakened when you look at what the Lord has done and you take credit for it yourself. Okay, uh, somebody's a little slow. Um, um, Nicole and I are in a PhD program, PhD, and when we started the PhD program, we had an orientation. And in the orientation, the dean of students comes to meet with us to tell us about the PhD programs and the requirements. She says to us, listen, we want to see you graduate. We will help you do whatever we can to get you out this program. She said, but the one crime that you cannot commit that will get you kicked out of this program is the highest crime of the academy. We will help you work through anything, but if you commit the high crime of the academy, we've got to kick you out of this program. I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, Mrs. Dean, uh, what is the highest crime of the academy? She said, plagiarism. Now, if you ain't been to school in a while, let me tell you what plagiarism is. It's real simple. If you read it and got it from somewhere else and you put it in your own paper like you got it all by yourself, you are not qualified to graduate from this program. If you ever got it somewhere else and act like you got it all by yourself, you are not qualified for this program. 
Beloved, I came by to call out some spiritual plagiarism of those who come to church week in and week out and act like you made it by yourself. You arrived by yourself. You got it by yourself. You earned it by yourself. No, baby girl, you got it from God, and you ought to have enough good sense to give God the glory and the credit for what the Lord has done. Is there anybody here who's not ashamed to give glory to God that the Lord brought me through? The Lord opened the door. The Lord made the way. The Lord answered the prayer. The Lord signed the check. The Lord healed my body. Hey! I've, 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 I've got to give God the credit for what the Lord has done. I... I uh, I'm probably the shortest preacher y'all done had. I'm done. You know, I don't like to be long-winded. The mind can only absorb what the butt can endure. I'm... He's weakened because he's fixated on feelings and not focused on fact. He's weakened because he's been seduced by success into a space of self-sufficiency. But watch this last one. He is weakened because he cited a strange source for his strength. I want you to stay with me because I'm about to disturb what your second grade Sunday school teacher taught you. Delilah says to Samson, what's the source of your strength? He says, if you cut my hair. So you missed that. It, you, you, you've been taught that so long. You missed. Samson, what makes you strong? My hair. Yeah, yeah. Samson, what gives you strength? My hair. Now, we've always been taught that the source of Samson's strength was his hair. And the reason we got there is by a process of elimination because there are three restrictions on the Nazarite life. I told you there's going to be a pop quiz. The three restrictions. No alcohol, no dead body, no haircut. Stay with me. By the time you get to chapter 16, Samson has violated two of those three. He goes into a Philistine wedding and is there for seven days. And by assumption, we know that wherever there is wedding, there's wine. You remember that whole uh, Cana thing, Jesus uh, run out of wine, touched the water. There's wine at weddings. And what is assumed is that he's already had wine, but he doesn't lose his strength. He kills a lion and goes back the next day to get honey out the lion's mouth so he touches the dead lion. He's violated number two, and he doesn't lose his strength. And so by process of elimination, we say, well, if he could drink wine and not lose his strength and touch a dead body and not lose his strength, then by process of elimination, his strength must be in his hair. Wrong. Can I tell you why he could drink wine and not lose his strength? Can, can I give you a hypothesis as to why he could touch a dead body and not lose his strength? Can I tell you why he could disobey God and not reap all the consequences? Not because his hair and his strength were tied together. No. He could drink wine and touch a dead body and not lose his strength because God is merciful. They, you turn my mic off. God is merciful. You can let God down and God will not let you down. You can disobey God and God won't take his hand off of you. There ought to be some shouting going on right about now. You know you've gone as low as you can go with God, and God was still faithful. He still blessed you. He still woke you up. He still gave you what you asked for. Is there anybody here who knows you never reap everything you sow? You've sown some stuff, and God blocked you from reaping. Somebody holler, he's merciful. He's merciful. Now I would argue with you that Samson's strength 
was never in his hair. There's nowhere in the Bible where God said, your strength is in your hair. As a matter of fact, if I can argue my case, there are three times Samson uses his strength. When he kills the armies of Ashkelon, when he kills the lion, and when he kills a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. And in each instance, when he uses his strength, the very verse before that says the same thing. Go on and read it, 14 and 15. Three times. And every time he uses his strength, the verse before it says the same thing. Before he killed the lion, the verse before says, and the spirit of the Lord descended on Samson. Before he fought the armies of Ashkelon, the verse before it says, and the spirit of the Lord descended on Samson. Before he killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, the spirit of the Lord descended upon Samson. You want to know what made Samson strong? It ain't got nothing to do with his hair. What made him strong is that he had a God that whenever he needed God, God showed up the verse before he needed him. Goodbye, New Calvary. But that's somebody's testimony tonight that the reason I made it is because I've got a God who showed up in the nick of time. He gave me strength just when I needed it. He came through just when I needed it. He walked with me just when I needed it. Is there anybody here that knows he showed up right on time? Oh, I'm done, I'm done. He shows up and gives Samson strength. But somebody, you're arguing with me right now. You, you, you know what you're saying to me? You're saying, well, Reverend, that's, if that's true, why is it when his hair got cut, he lost his strength? Right, right. If you're telling me that his strength ain't in his hair, why did the haircut make him lose his strength? Somebody says that's a good question. I'm going to tell you why. The reason Samson loses his strength when his hair is cut is not because his strength was in his hair. He loses his strength because that's where he thought his strength was. Where do you think your strength comes from? And here's the problem Samson had. When he identifies his strength with his hair and he lays down, he puts it somewhere she has access to. You got to be careful of locating your strength in something somebody has access to. Because if they've got access to it, They'll cut it. So if your strength is in your money, be careful. Because you'll get laid off and it'll get cut. If your strength is in your beauty, watch out. Old age is coming. And stuff that lives upstairs <laughs> is going to move downstairs. And it'll never go back where it's supposed to be. If your strength is in that relationship, watch out, because he'll break your heart. If your strength is in the money you've acquired, watch out, recession will hit you. Imagine what the conversation would have been like if it went something like this. Delilah says, Samson, what's the source of your strength? Samson looked back and said, baby, I got some bad news for you. Oh, my strength is not in my hair. You can cut my hair, and I'll still be strong. You can do me wrong, and I'll still be strong. You can call me everything you want, and I'm still going to wake up in the morning. Because the source of my strength is nothing you can cut. All of my help, all of my help, it comes from the Lord. And because God is the source, nothing can separate me from my strength in God. Goodbye, New Calvary. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I'm looking for somebody who knows that God is the source of my strength. 
God is the one that wakes me up in the morning. God is my joy. God is. Somebody say, God is. God is. God is. Goodbye, New Calvary. But there's an old song. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. And he's never, ever fallen short of his word. I got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way. Leave my life holy each and every day. I want to go with him when he comes back. I've come too far and I'll never turn back. God is. God is. God is. God is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Hey. Hey, hey, somebody holler, God is, God is my strength, God is my refuge, God is my way maker, God is my provider, God is, God is, yes he is, yes he is. Thank you.